Today I'm going to talk a bit about famous scholars who lorded over a massive system of hard labor. So if any of you uh, get hard time from your professors, feel free to empathize with my subjects, the victims of the Song Dynasty's mass system of incarceration, labor, and warfare. The title of this workshop is Contextualizing the Self, Creating and Recreating in the First Person. So what kind of self am I going to talk about? In my, in my work, I have a bit of a problem with the first person because my subjects never produce their own texts. Instead, I will talk a bit about how I approach the self, the creation of a self from three different angles. First, I will ask whether it's possible to recover the identity and voice of a lower class group solely through the writings of the elites. I will then talk a bit about my historical subjects, the Southern <coughs> Dynasty's elites, as well and especially its lower classes. In this case, I claim that the new elite constructed its identity through the creation of a new criminalized military lower class. The third kind of self I will talk about belongs to a specific individual, the famous Song general, Yuan Fei. In the process, I will also tell you a bit about my secret weapon for this mission, the military tattoo. And I will also explain what I mean by that later on. So the final part of my talk is going to be more of a, a case study. Uh, I'm using my insights. <coughs> First, a few words about the Song Dynasty. The Song existed for about 300 years, 10th century to 13th century. I know I'm a little bit biased, but let me tell you something. The Song, Song China was the world's most advanced civilization of its time. Printing, economic growth, technological breakthroughs, mass production, a cultural renaissance, the rise of a meritocracy, yes, it was the best. Sorry for all people studying other civilizations. <laughs> but when it came to fighting and warfare, the Song didn't have a very good reputation. It was defeated many times on the battlefield by its strong non-Chinese neighbors. The Song state did not suffer from any major rebellions, like all other major <coughs> dynasties did. But instead, it met its doom from the outside, first at the hands of the Jurchen Jin dynasty, then at the hands of the Mongols under Kublai Khan. So some basic terms. In the course of this lecture, I will mention the Northern Song and the Southern Song. So the first half of the song is called the Northern Song, for the simple reason that the dynasty controlled northern China. Uh, <coughs> later on, the Jurchen people, a non-Chinese group living in the area of Manchuria, took all of the northern half of the Song Empire, and they founded the Jin Dynasty. The Song Dynasty survived in lesser form with a capital in the south for another century and a half. That part is known as the Southern Song. The Song of the Song was ultimately destroyed by the Mongols, who came from further up north. So Song Dynasty history mostly revolves around a group known as the Scholar Officials, and the wider group from which they came, the Gentry, or basically the Chinese elites. Why do historians focus on them? There is a relatively simple answer. They are the ones who produce nearly all of the historical records at our disposal. Nationally speaking, they were at the center of the story they told. And so, the cultural history of the Song dynasty is a history of their culture. Intellectual history of the Song is concerned with thought of the major intellectuals of this group. Social history of the Song is mostly about elite society. You get there. Hold on. Who were these scholar officials? Who were the gentry? They're an important part of the glory and awesomeness of Song history. We have to go back a little bit. The old aristocratic elite of the Tang, the Song's predecessor, was annihilated in the violent warfare of the 9th century. The new elite of the Song was non-hereditary. Their status was not based on noble birth, but on skill, hard work, respectability. The highest sign of achievement in Song society was passing the civil service examinations. Male members of elite families spent their entire childhood or their entire lives studying for these exams. Most men who studied for the examinations didn't pass them. But just taking those examinations was already very prestigious. And those who did pass the examinations were granted a position in the bureaucracy as officials. 
their future was secure. They basically became rock stars. And since the examination system was based on the knowledge of Chinese classical texts, you could say that the men who occupied the highest positions in Stone government were basically humanities scholars. There were historians, there were philosophers, there were poets, and they were very good at that. But in my work, I try to go beyond the world of the elite. Is it possible to recover a non-elite voice from accounts written by the elite? I make the claim that it is possible, at least to a certain degree, when it comes to soldiers. Soldiers, in Song times, were a very significant part of society. The Song dynasty had a huge standing army. It peaked at around 1.4 million men. <coughs> this doesn't include local militias that numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Who were the soldiers? Many of them were convicts assigned to military service, clumped together with refugees, non-Han groups, all sorts of other marginal populations. Some soldiers were pressed into service against their will. So let me give you a travel tip. If you're taking a vacation in the Song Empire and you're walking down the road and you see a pretty lady, she's wearing makeup, she's making some gestures saying, hey, come, come, come with me to the bushes. Sounds too good to be true? It is too good to be true. Because there's a couple more guys waiting there in the bushes. And if you follow that lady, you will end up in the army for the rest of your life. Uh, but don't be, don't be too be worried. Most soldiers came from military families who joined the army either because they were ordered to or they had no other options for sustaining themselves and their families. The Song military was in charge of national defense, but it also executed large labor projects, dragging boats, the postal system, producing wine, etc. They also took charge of local law enforcement. Life there was hard. Treatment was harsh, often cruel. The military system blurred the lines between soldiers and convicts by bringing together the state's military, penal, labor, and law enforcement systems together. And I refer to this system as the penal military complex. And so, we have a very big social group at the very bottom of society, the soldiers. If we include their families, then we are talking about a social group of millions of people, far bigger than the elite. In my work, I try to understand, first of all, the institutions of the penal military complex. What was the state trying to do to those people? Where did they come from? How was the military supposed to work? What was the military's role in some society? I then tried to understand how the residents of the penal military complex reacted to their terms of incarceration. One important advantage for looking at soldiers is that we get more details about them than we do about peasants, for example. Why is that? One possible explanation is that soldiers simply did not count. Peasants were considered a positive force in Song society, or traditionally in Imperial China, and definitely in Confucian rhetoric. So in Confucianism, I would use this broad, specific term, society is divided into a hierarchy. At the top, we have scholars or officials. They work with their minds, right? They run the show. Below them, we have peasants. They grow the food that allows everybody else to live, right? So they're pretty good. Below them, we have artisans. <coughs> they're not as good as peasants, but they're still producing something. So they're OK. At the very bottom, we have merchants. They're parasitic, right? They just make profit off the work other people do. But uh, during the Song Dynasty, we had another very important group, soldiers. And they were actually placed below everybody else. So, an official is supposed to help peasants, guide them, protect them. Nobody is supposed to mistreat them. So the way an individual is talking or writing about peasants reflects back on them. Soldiers are different. They matter less. Bad things can happen to them without drawing important conclusions or moral lessons out of it. And it's OK to write about it. Soldiers were peripheral. And that makes them valuable to us as historians. Why is that? Because the truth often exists in our peripheral vision, right? That's also how our brain operates, right? Our eyes see everything, but our brain filters most of that information and provides us with a picture that we can understand. But in that process, our brain relies on patterns it knows, patterns it is looking for. 
but it's in the corners, in the background, in the trivial details, where we can find often an unfiltered truth. So what allows us to see what's in our peripheral vision? Well, today, you could say it's like a photograph, right? The photograph imitates the human gaze. Once we have that photo, we can focus on any part of it we see fit. So another way to see this is to think of looking at historical evidence as if there were crime scene photos. The author's a criminal. The text is the crime scene. Yes, the author and the criminal had their own conscious intent, but us, the detectives investigating the crime, we're looking for elements of the crime that the criminal or author was perhaps unaware of. We can zoom in on details people who were at the scene could never have noticed. We can also zoom out and look at the image as part of a larger pattern that the perpetrator of the crime would not have been aware of. And regardless of what the perpetrator would say about their intent, Within the crime scene photo, the psychosis of the criminal is revealed. So I worked with many types of primary sources. In the beginning, anecdotal collections were the most useful source for me to figure out the state of mind of the elite. These texts are very useful to me because they are gossipy in nature, and they are far less restrained than, let's say, uh, letters, definitely less than memorials, imperial edicts, or political histories. Many of the authors of these anecdotes were high officials, important players in the political world. But in anecdotal collections, they could share random stories, tidbits that are funny or sad, anything they found to be interesting. But especially because these texts were also peripheral from a political point of view, they offer us an important political insight. Anecdotal collections can be like the racist or sexist joke the politician makes once he's back home on the couch holding a beer. These jokes can tell us more about the real political agenda than many of the speeches these people make in Parliament. So I treated the anecdotal collections as a window into the mind of song elites. I looked for patterns in how they wrote about life. Once I looked closer, I saw an interesting fact. Soldiers appear in many places, often in the background. Their servants, their criminals, they're often used as plot devices to say some larger point about their officials. <coughs> Officials were very concerned about military affairs. They often dealt with military affairs, and they often dealt specifically, very personally, with soldiers. Reading through the anecdotes, I began to see patterns emerging. I could see that the scholars often interacted with soldiers. Actually, they were surrounded by soldiers. Soldiers were their guards, their servants, all soldiers discharged from the, from the army due to disease or old age, often made a living as servants in the houses of the rich or beg for a living in the streets. So it's not just officials, right? Everybody can see them. In many of the accounts where soldiers are mentioned, they're portrayed in a rather negative fashion. They're violent and unruly as soldiers. They run away from battle. Even as servants, they tend to do a bad job. I got the feeling the people who wrote the text I was reading didn't like soldiers very much. So soldiers were both very present, yet missing at the same time. And sometimes it is out of silences and gaps that important historical truths emerge. If soldiers are there all the time, how are they invisible to us? I was trying to understand the relationship between soldiers and the <coughs> And the key that allowed me to unlock at least a part of that relationship was a textual form that is unique to middle period China. From about the ninth middle period China, from about the 9th century to the end of the 13th century, at least that textual form. This textual form is the military tattoo. In the Song military, they used to tattoo soldiers on their faces with the name and number of their unit. These facial military tattoos were considered a terrible thing, an extremely unpopular measure. So tattooing was actually one of the reasons men didn't want to join the army. It was supposed to prevent soldiers from deserting, or at least make it easier to catch deserters. It didn't seem to work. In the Song military, desertion was a huge problem. And the men who deserted, since they had their faces marked as soldiers, had no choice but to become bandits. So banditry was a big problem during the Song. Tattoos are useful to the historian in a number of ways. Tattoos are a text within a text. The Song Dynasty's military tattoos were actually texts rather than images, although sometimes they were images. And so when we see mentions of tattoos in the primary sources, those are basically quotes 
of another form of text that existed at the time. And just like soldiers were peripheral in some society, tattoos were a peripheral text. It was not part of the curriculum for the examinations. It was not as important as a memorial. It wasn't as beautiful as a poem. But millions and millions of people knew these texts very well. They were etched to the faces of their parents, their neighbors. They were what awaited you if you misbehaved. So even illiterate people could read this text very well. Like soldiers who were both present and missing in the primary sources, tattoos too were present and missing at the same time. The fact that some soldiers were tattooed is no, it's no secret. But it received very little attention considering the fact that hundreds of thousands of people at any given time were tattooed on the face. It was a fact of life that was very much visible to all people living at the time. So just by being aware of this fact, we are already getting closer to the world of the penal military complex. Tattoos offer an important clue to us by the very fact of their existence. Again, according to Confucianism, tattoos are a bad thing. We received our bodies from our parents, right? Our body is a present, we must cherish it, protect it. We must not cause injury to our skin or to even a single hair. Right? Why was it acceptable to mutilate the bodies of hundreds of thousands of people? The song that <coughs> is often hailed by historians as a positive theory of economic growth, cultural golden age, and especially for the new ideal of social mobility, right? Anybody who wants to can make it now. But the same state that promoted the civil service examination system was also responsible for tattooing of the lower classes. And while occasionally some official voiced their concerns over tattooing, these voices were very few and far apart. Some officials even called out for the expansion of tattooing. So in one case, the state was conscripting men in the border zones for the militias. Men in the militias usually had the back of their hands tattooed. But apparently that's not enough. An official was complaining. He's saying it's not working. These guys don't want to be in the militias. They run away, they change their names, they hide, so you see, tattooing the back of the hand is not enough. We need to tattoo them on the face. Uh, I think we clearly see the element of social control here. Full-time soldiers were tattooed on their faces. So that, this small detail is actually huge. It appears to me that soldiers were not considered to be fully human. Yes, the Song state was fighting dangerous and strong enemy states. But as far as many officials were concerned, their own soldiers were the real and immediate danger to their own safety. So, I then brought that insight back into all other descriptions of the military systems <coughs> and discussions of soldiers. Because after all, to understand an organization, we need to understand the social attitude of the people who are part of that organization. And law by itself does not tell us how police officers enforce the law. It doesn't tell us how prosecutors <coughs> prosecute or how judges judge. It's also very similar to how race and class function in today's world. I'm not talking about good officials or bad officials. Um, like racism isn't something that only bad people have, and the nicest billionaire also takes, takes share in the exploitation of the poor and degradation of the planet. In the same manner, being a member of the elite during the song, or journey, being elite, involved the creation of the penal military complex. After all, the new elite did not come into the world by itself. The creation of a new non-hereditary elite brought with it the creation of a new criminalized lower class. The scholar official built a career on his mental skills, hard work, and respectable background. The soldier conflict was a marginal creature with a dubious past, and it didn't matter how smart or moral he was. On the top, we have a group of people who are there because they deserve it. And on the bottom, we have a group of, of people who are there because they deserve it. After all, you could not have a new group in society, or a new elite for that matter, without having a realignment of all of society as a whole. The state opened up the examination system and made it into the most important tool for social mobility, at least upward social mobility. But this was not necessarily a positive development for all of society. Not everybody got a chance for climbing up the social ladder. 
because in the process, again, of creating scholar official, the state created the tattooed faces who were excluded from respectable society. Okay, so far we talked about groups. And this is also part of the limitations placed on us by the sources. We see, yes, we can see individual faces of soldiers, but only as glimpses. Mostly we cannot really follow the life or story of a specific soldier. But we do have a couple of stories of spectacular social mobility through the army. There were soldiers in the front line who by merit and skill climbed up the ranks and became famous generals. I'm going to discuss the case of a very celebrated character in Chinese history, the general UFA and his tattoos. Hopefully, in the process, we also catch a glimpse of the people and culture of the Song Dynasty's penal military complex. So, descriptions of the downfall of the famous Southern Song general, UFA, reach a tragic height in a famous scene. Qing Wei sent a messenger to arrest UFA and his sons so they can testify about the Jiangxian affair. When the messenger arrived, UFA said, the heaven and the earth can attest for this heart. At first, they ordered He Zhu to interrogate him. UFA tore the shirt off his body and showed his back to Zhu. There were four big characters on his back. To exhaust one's loyalty in service of the state written in lines that were deeply carved into his skin. And since the investigation brought no proof against UFA, Zhu realized Fei was not guilty. So, in this dramatic scene from the Song political history, the Southern Song general, UFA, became one of the immortal heroes of the Chinese people. UFA, China's perhaps greatest patriot, became a symbol of courage and sacrifice for one's motherland. The tattoo on his back was one of the symbols of UFA and of patriotism. UFA's tattoo is a text hidden under several layers, hidden under UFA's shirt, but also hidden within the text that tells his story. Because UFA's tattoo had its own story and its own history. So <coughs> let us then reevaluate re UFA's story by taking the focus away from UFA and placing it on the practice of military tattoos during the song, but especially of loyalist tattoos. So, first, it's necessary to tell you the traditional story of UFA, the way it's remembered in popular imagination, but also, I dare say, by uh, quite a few modern scholars. And so the story goes. In the beginning of the 12th century, in the time of Emperor Huizong, the Song Dynasty entered a period of decline. The emperor, obsessed with pleasure and fine arts, left government to the management of psychophantic favorites and evil ministers who brought the country to the brink of ruin. A failed alliance with the Jurchen people led to calamity. The Jurchen invasion that resulted brought about humiliating defeats. The capital, Kaifang, a gem of the world, was pillaged. The imperial clan fell into captivity. The Jurchens scattered the Song armies, defeating forces many times their own size. Only one imperial prince escaped south and continued to lead resistance to the invaders. That was Prince Zhao Go, known to us as Emperor Gao Zong. But in this time of defeat and humiliation rose a new hero, Refei. A man of humble background joined the army and rose through the ranks until he became a general of the country's finest army. Where others were defeated, he gained victory. Where others betrayed, he remained loyal. While other armies pillaged and robbed the common people, his army was a model of restraint and discipline. USA defeated bandits and rebels and became a pillar of stability to the new southern regime. <coughs> USA then turned his attention to the Jurchen enemy. And just as he was within grasp of the old capital, he was summoned back to the south, where he was investigated for trumped-up charges, tortured, and murdered in prison. The evil official Qing Wei, leader of the peace faction, led the signing of a humiliating treaty with the Jurchens. The north was forever lost. The country was betrayed. Years later, UFA was posthumously rehabilitated. Temples were built in his memory. With time, a cult developed around him, and it thrives to this day. 
<laughs> Rafi's temples and his story are now powerful tools for producing patriotism and nationalism in modern China. Fortunately, I don't have images of Song soldiers, but I do have images of uh, Rafi's tattoo. This was his tattoo. <coughs> this is from the Rafi temple in Hanzhou, uh, the historical capital of the Southern Song. It's in a beautiful location on the Western Lake. This temple is extremely busy. A lot of people go there to see it. This is, of course, UFA. Above him is a sign, return my rivers and mountains to me. Right? No, I can take territory from, or should take territory from China. And over here, you can see it behind this pillar. There's a sign that has his tattoo on it. So his tattoo is really uh, very closely associated with his story. <coughs> This is Jing Wei and his wife, Madame Wang. Uh, they're kneeling in shame outside the temple. People used to spit at them and throw rocks at them. It's not allowed, now there's a fence protecting them. Uh, but they're still punished. It's not the only UFA temple. I was surprised I discovered there's other. There's another UFA temple in Hunan. Uh, here we have more representatives of the evil peace faction. Don't we all hate the peace faction? Uh, they're all kneeling in shame in front of the UFA temple, <coughs> and over, again, uh, above the entrance here, or doorway, is uh, UFA's tattoo. It's a pretty important text. So, the ways we tell UFA story are part of larger narratives that dominate our understanding of the Song Dynasty. One such narrative is the struggle between the civil realm, or when, and the martial realm, or who. The founders of the Song <coughs> took power away from their generals and put it in the hands of the civil officials. According to this narrative, the plot against UFA was carried out in order to curtail the power of the new generals that rose to power during the early Southern Song. The other main narrative, more relevant for the popular understanding of UFA, is the narrative of the Song as a struggle between a Chinese state and non-Chinese states on its borders. This narrative became extremely important during China's century of humiliation, as China set upon the uneasy task of becoming a nation state. Political developments had a very direct impact on the interpretation of UFA story. So in 1931, the Japanese military staged an explosion on, uh, on a railway and used it as a pretext to take over Manchuria. This event came to be known as the Manchurian Incident. And so, before the Manchurian Incident, some Chinese scholars argued peace with the churches was a necessary deal. After the Manchurian Incident, scholars began to say that peace with the churches was caused by a weak leadership. So we don't need to stretch the imagination to connect this to China's situation versus Japan in the 1930s. In communist China, UFA story offers new challenges. The communists offer liberation to both the Chinese nation and the oppressed classes of all ethnicities. What to do then with UFA, who was a national hero, but also according to Marxist interpretation, an oppressor of the masses and a servant of the corrupt imperial regime. So the great Song scholar, Dan Guangming, tried to sell some of that contradiction by arguing that the Song's war was not against the church and people as a whole, only against its exploitative nobility. <laughs> These days, when discussing the Song, the narrative of the Song as an ethnic struggle is still highly influential. And UFA is a hero of that struggle, <coughs> a hero that protected the territorial integrity of the Chinese state. Scholars on both sides of the Taiwan Straits who talk about the Jurchens still speak in terms of us and them. The Jurchens are outsiders, but all those who identify themselves with the Han Chinese can regard themselves as insiders. This nationalist gaze obfuscates our reading of UFA story. The nationalist narrative runs so deep, it's embedded within the Chinese language. So when scholars discuss UFA story in Chinese, the peace with the Jurchens is a bending of the knees. The Jurchens coming into China is a rude invasion. The song military weakness is regrettable. UFA was first vilified by his enemies, 
But later on, he became practically deified, a paragon of patriotism and loyalty. Is it possible to find other voices within the big narratives that his memory is serving? In order to find new entry points into his story, I chose to focus on two seemingly minor aspects of his life. The first, what his tattoo made him, that is, a tattooed general. The second, the meaning and context of his tattoo, the so-called loyalist tattoo. So UFA was not the only tattoo general during the song. The Northern Song had a famous tattoo general by the name of Di Ching. Di Ching too was a brave man of a humble background who rose through the ranks. Eventually, he reached one of the top political positions in the empire. An incredible achievement in a time dominated by glorious scholar officials. Stories about Di Ching show him to be both admired and detested. So on one hand, we see stories where he's very proud of his tattoos. Once the emperor offered Di Ching to give him some medicine, for example, to remove his tattoos as a reward for his uh, loyal service to the empire. Di Ching refused, saying, I want to keep these tattoos. I want to keep them to inspire the soldiers around the empire. And actually, the emperor was pretty happy at his reply. When another official is mocking his tattoo, Di Ching doesn't break a sweat. He actually gives a very clever retort that keeps that other uh, very smart, educated scholar official very <coughs> ashamed of himself. But in other stories, we see him as a drunk who can't control his temper when a concubine is mocking his tattooed face. The mirror tattoos on his face provided fuel for both favorable and negative views of his characters. They were a symbol of his pride and his shared bond with the soldiers of the rank and file, but they were also a target for ridicule and derision. But still, the stories about Di Ching make it clear his tattoos were a point of tension in court. And these tattoos meant he was the odd one out among the men born to elite households. Di Ching's tattoo was unlike that of the UFA. We do, not, we do not know what it was exactly, but it was probably a standard Northern Song mini tattoo. That means uh, he was tattooed on the face uh, with a number and name of his unit. Right? So Northern Song soldiers tattooed in the face, sometimes arms. Sometimes the names of these Northern Song tattoos had a loyalist ring to them, something like loyal and brave. But that was only the unit's name. It wasn't a voluntary tattoo. It definitely had nothing to do with the state of mind of the soldiers. These tattoos, like I said before, were actually one of the most hated aspects of military service of their relationship to the state. Northern Song military, to, military tattoos were a bit like a system of filing and categorizing, only they did so on skin rather than on paper. These tattoos had a function of preventing desertion, but they had a complex layer of meanings. There are symbols of the convict, the lower class, and the other undesirable types that served in the Song armies. There were an expression of the state's power over its subjects and of the elite's power over the underclass. Tattoos, a symbol of sovereignty, also came to be used as a symbol of resistance. So in some Northern Song rebellions, the rebels seized the local population, tattooed and conscripted them into the rebel army. Some, like the rebel soldier Wang Zi in 1048, used the tattoo as a call for defiance. Wang Zi himself was tattooed with a character Fortune, or Fu by his mother. He tattooed his soldiers with the line, the righteous army will defeat the Zhao House and attain victory. Zhao House is, of course, it's the Song Imperial House. When the Northern Song collapsed, a war began. A war that lasted a generation. That's the war with the Jurchens. The war acted actually as a huge prison break because the Song's military camps were also huge prisons. Tattooed soldiers, some bandits, some rebels, or both, roamed the countryside. And some of these former soldier convicts formed new armies and had them tattooed. Ding Jin had the characters entering fire, tattooed on his men's faces. Traitors tattooed too. The general Miao Fu, who attempted to overthrow Emperor Gao Zong, also tattooed himself new soldiers. Even the churches tattooed some of the Chinese they kidnapped and sold off to slavery in the international marketplace of 12th century East Asia. 
Among these tattoos, a different kind of tattoo was becoming more common. Those were the loyalist tattoos. But loyalist tattoos have their own history. And some of them actually, we have to go back, some of them go back to the late years of the time. <coughs> In the beginning of the 10th century, the warlord, Liu Renglong, forced all men in the territory controlled to join his army and had them tattooed on the face. Those of higher social standing were tattooed on the arm with the line, serve the ruler with all my heart. This tattoo, far from expressing loyalty, was an example of coercion and brutality. The early Northern Song military official, Hu Yanzhen, was tattooed with the characters Kill the Kitans. Kitans were the song <coughs> the major enemy in the first half of the dynasty. So kill the Kitans with a sincere heart. He had his sons tattooed with the characters when living, forsaking home for the state, when going to battle, forsaking life for the ruler. So Emperor Taizong, himself a military man by upbringing, was far from impressed by his unorthodox ways and actually almost had him beheaded for him. Hu Yanzhen was saved only by making the emperor laugh. <clears throat> In the early Sound and Song, loyalist tattoos made a renewed appearance. An official called uh, by the name of Wang Yan led an army made of scattered soldiers that resisted the Jin invasion deep in enemy territory. According to the account, when Wang Yan's officers saw him uneasy, unable to sleep, all his soldiers volunteered to tattoo their faces with the eight characters, swearing to kill the Jin caitiffs and not to betray the Zhao king. They became known as the Eight Characters Army. Was their action really voluntary? To me, it seems highly unlikely. Even so, other stories of loyalist tattoos show completely different aspects to them. Actually, loyalist tattoos were used by rebels as well. In 1127, Gu Jin, a rebel soldier, had his soldiers tattooed with the characters not betraying the Zhao king. In 1130, rebel soldiers tattooed their armies with the characters coming together to restore the song. The view from the court to loyalist tattoos was also very far from favorable. So much so, actually, that in 1128, the official Zong Zi begged Emperor Gao Zong not to declare as bandits the men of loyalist armies who had their faces tattooed. Of course, with text saying they're loyal to the dynasty. There were apparently many soldiers in early Song and Song court who were veterans of the Great War with the Jurchens. Many of them had big loyalist tattoos on their faces with sayings like, kill the enemy, serve the state. What was their reward? In 1137, it was decided that they not be allowed around the emperor. When the general Li Yong, himself formerly a bandit, who had two flags tattooed on his face, entered the court for an interview with Gao Zong, the officials who let him in grew very suspicious. Uh, they investigated the matter. Eventually, in 1144, two years after Yue Fei's death, it was decided to allow tattooed officials to see the emperor. A minor concession to the tattooed faces that only underscores the suspicious reception they usually received. So now, if we go back to the FA story, we can see the tattoos had a wide range of meanings to them that went far beyond, and sometimes in contradiction to loyalism. Military tattoos, already a mark of the criminal, the lower class, the violent, and the savage, were reflecting the social mobility afforded these tattoos in times of war. Compared with the Northern Song standardized military tattoos, the phenomenon of spontaneous loyalist tattoos also reflects the Southern Song's loss of much of its ability to control its lower class subjects and their bodies. These tattoos also had another meaning. Though military tattoos were born out of coercion, they came to symbolize a lower class martial culture and their own form of masculinity and pride. Perhaps no text captures that culture better than the Ming novel, The Water Margin, Okay, for those of you who haven't heard about that new novel, The Water Margin is a famous account of the adventures of 108 men and also a couple of women included there. Some of them were bandits, some were tattooed soldiers on the run. 
All of them became outlaws who opposed the corrupt Song state and celebrated their camaraderie and masculinity with raucous celebrations of drinking and violence, often directed against corrupt and evil officials. The water margin is actually in many ways an accurate reflection of Song military institutions and social types. UFA would feel quite at home among the 108 rebel heroes that lived at the water margin. Like those rebels, UFA was a strong, tough man of humble origins. Like them, he showed little interest in women, except his mother, of course. Like them, he committed terrible, violent acts, tearing the heart out of his uncle's chest, or beating a man half to death in a drunken fit. Like them, he wore a tattoo proudly on his body. And he was also a lover of real men, or in Chinese, Hao Han. When his <coughs> men trapped a bandit, the bandit called out to them, Don't kill me! I'm a Hao Han! They spared him and brought him before UFA. The great general immediately rose and released the ropes on the bandit's body and appointed him as one of his own lieutenants. Such a scene can surely rival the behavior of the water margin's bandit leader, Song Jiang. So when UFA tore the shirt from his body and exposed his tattoo, he didn't necessarily display his loyalty to the emperor. Within his tattoo, there's a conflict, a contradiction, and out of it arises a different voice that tells us of an act of defiance, an expression of pride in a martial culture that his higher class enemies had no part in. That he was a real man, a Hao Han, and that they were not. It was a final declaration of who he was and where he came from. <coughs> and in that sense, UFA truly was a hero of the people. Thank you very much.